This episode is brought to you by Bridges Academy Online, an online high school for twice exceptional students. Find them at bridges.edu. That's what I love about looking at everything through the lens of neurodiversity, because we can see typical deficits and turn it into strengths and see, okay, up to what point is it making you not function the way you want to? It's something that we've been considering for a long time, and it's kind of a chicken and egg question. Does personality impact neurodivergence, or is it the other way around? Today, we're talking with Dr. Alex Fweek. Alex is a researcher and psychologist who specializes in giftedness and neurodiversity, and she's joining us today from Paraguay. We'll break down what we know and what we're hoping to learn from research. That's all straight ahead on episode 147. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and this is the Neurodiversity Podcast. What is neurodiversity? You see the world differently. Autism spectrum. Gifted. Complexities that are inherently inside. ADHD. Dysgraphia. Tourette's. All brains are different. You are exactly what this world needs. This is the Neurodiversity Podcast. As we move into the holidays, we'll all be experiencing different kinds of stress, and it's nice to know that you're not in it alone. It's a perfect time to meet new friends and share thoughts and experiences. That's what our Facebook group is all about. It's called the Neurodiversity Podcast Advocacy and Support Group, and we put a link to it in the description, so click through and hang out with us. Dr. Alex Week is a pioneer in gifted education research, practice, and advocacy in Paraguay. And in a minute, she'll be joining us to talk about the confluence and common ground of personality and neurodiversity. Stay right there. On a previous episode of the Neurodiversity Podcast... Even before you seek that professional advice or consultation, evaluation, etc., you could start by having a conversation with your kid and have that conversation in a calm way. You know, if, if you seem stressed and scared or panicked or angry or upset, then you're going to convey that to your kid as well. You could just start by asking some questions like, how are you doing? What is on your mind? Share a little bit of your experience and model to your family that it's okay to go through difficult emotional experiences. And we all do sometimes. You know, sometimes we're so determined to show our kids that we're there for them that without realizing it, we may also be giving the message it's bad to be rattled or it's not okay to be upset. That's episode 110. Find it in your favorite podcast app. You're listening to the Neurodiversity Podcast. Today, we're talking to Alex Fuik. Alex is a researcher and psychologist specializing in giftedness and neurodiversity, and she is joining us today from Paraguay. So, Alex, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you for having me here. I am very excited that we can have this conversation. We've been working on it for a while, trying to get it scheduled. I'm glad we were finally able to to make it all happen. Absolutely. One of the fascinating things that you've studied is how personality impacts a wide range of factors in a person's life. And one of those is related to what's called the Big Five personality model. So to start off our conversation, can you share just a little bit about the Big Five personality model? Because even though this is widely known and understood in the field of psychology, a lot of our audience is probably unfamiliar with it. The Big Five personality model is the model that has the strongest research support so far. And it states that pretty much every personality trait that you can think of can be modeled in in a continuum of five traits. And those are the Big Five. And those traits are like a continuum that go from zero to 100, so to say. And from the combination of where you fall in each one, one of those, that's where your unique personality comes. So one of those is extroversion. And of it, we have extroverted people that get their emotional energy refueled through interaction with others. And on the other extreme, we have introverts who get their emotional energy through being with themselves or a small group of people. They recharge in time alone. It doesn't like being an introvert doesn't mean that you don't like other people, but that 
you expend energy being with others. And so in that continuum from both extremes, you have a million shades of gray. Another one of the big five personality factors is agreeableness, which is on one end, how nice, how agreeable, the tendency to trust others, the tendency to be modest and to be humble and to care about the well-being of others. And on the other extreme, we have people that are more realistic, that put judgment first, that put their, their needs first, and that have a little mistrust in others, and they tend to be a bit wary in their interactions. And again, that goes from zero to 100, and we can have all of the combinations in there. Another one of those is conscientiousness, which is one that is very valued in this society. Uh, to the point that one of the extremes is a person that is very responsible, very achievement-oriented, goal-driven, and puts duty first and play gums later and ha like has a very big sense of order and organization. On the other extreme, we have people that are a bit more happy-go-lucky and they're more playful and they go with the flow and see where life takes them. Not so much achievement-oriented, not so much goals-driven, but... They just see where life takes them and are a bit more unorganized and not so keen on order and organization. Another one of those is the one that's called neuroticism on one extreme or neuroticism and the other extreme is emotional stability. So people that are more neurotic tend to be more vulnerable to stress, tend to feel more negative emotions, have more anxiety, have more depression. And not as disorders, but as states, okay? As states of being, they, they just feel more naturally drawn to that. They can have a bit more angry hostility and feel a bit more, yeah, more vulnerable to stress and perhaps more impulsive even. And on the other extreme, we have people that are very emotionally stable and the ones that you want to be with if there's a fire, because they'll be like, oh, <laughs> like they'll keep their cool and know what to do. And they are not very vulnerable to stress and they don't have a tendency to feel many negative emotions. And last but not least, let's go with my own personal favorite to the point that it's a big topic in my research, which is openness to experience. Openness to experience is a tendency to engage with the world through cognitive exploration. Is I wanna know more about the world. I wanna have different experiences be outer like experiences or inner experiences. And on the other extreme, we have people that are very traditional, very conservative, and like they do the things as they're told and they like to have it settled for them and they like to have it decided. They like the way it's always been and that's what they go for. And so again, we have a whole range in there. Yeah, Those are the big five in general. And then each of those actually can be split in smaller sections that are called facets that relate to specific parts of those factors. So that's why I think it's so fascinating. I would love to see more commercial products based on the big five as there are for other for other personality tests that can make it more accessible to the public. Yeah, because we hear about like the Myers-Briggs and uh, another big popular one that I see now is like Enneagrams and different things. But really, <laughs> if you want to talk about research, if you want to talk about things that are that really have value and stability, even across cultures, the big five is the way to go. Absolutely. And so I one of the things, one of the problems I see is that Right now, the way it's uh, presented to the general public is if you want to know about the big five, you have to do a test that can only be administered by a psychologist. Right. You have to have what is called a C-level qualification that requires uh, a PhD, basically. Right. Or a master's and intensive training. And so that is not accessible as opposed to other personality tests that you just go online and click, 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 click. You pay $40 and here's your report. Yeah. There's some value to understanding some of those things. I mean, obviously, that's why these types of different tests are so popular. And one of the things that you've really researched, though, specifically, is about how cognitive giftedness is, is interacting with or influenced by the Big Five personality model, and specifically, the trait of openness to experience. So can you share a little bit about that? It originally started from the idea that families 
parents, teachers, like everyone that came across intellectually gifted people were saying like they're intense and they need to know and they have a drive to know and they won't stop until they figure out everything and they feel so many things. And so there was only one explanation at one point that is overexcitabilities posited by Kazimierz Dabrowski, a Polish psychologist in the 60s. And that was the only theory that could explain that. And that theory has very little empirical support. And so in the light of the little empirical support and the observations that so many people were making in the sense that this is happening. So if you're telling me that this theory doesn't have a lot of support, then what explanation are you giving me for this? So we realized that it was pretty much identical. Like the, if you, the definitions to openness to experience in the big five, especially the traits as named in one specific test that is called the NEO. Mm -hmm. I did a little game one time at NAGC at the conference at the Graduate Student Research Gala, where I put the definitions of uh, openness facets and of overexcitabilities and asked in a poster and asked the people that passed by to map it and to figure out which, where they went. They couldn't really differentiate because they were pretty much the same. Mm. So if they're conceptually similar, if they're the same, then do they hold up in tests? And we found out it did. So a lot of research says that general intelligence and openness are moderately related, which means more often than not, cognitively gifted people will tend to be open, but there's a lot of them that may not be open. Like it's not a necessary trait. But if you take them in a, like as a group, people with high cognitive abilities tend to be more open to experience than the general population. You can absolutely be very open and not have like high cognitive abilities, but more often than not, it happens that way. Understanding also, it might vary between those different facets that you mentioned. So there are six facets to openness to experience, if I'm recalling correctly. There's the intellect piece, which is like the curiosity, right? Mm -hmm. And that one, I think, is always the most strongly connected with that cognitive giftedness. But what are the other facets? And how does that kind of interplay with where that giftedness may or may not interact with with that personality trait? Yeah. So there's many different uh, models to measure openness. Mm. And so some are more aligned than others. But the one that is more closely aligned is the one that, for right, Costa and McRae, the NEO, that personality test. And so that one talks about six different facets. One of them is uh, called openness to fantasy. Uh, high scorers in that trait have like very intense imagination. They can conjure up vivid images in their mind. They can make it, make up elaborate stories. They can look into the future. They can create like imaginary worlds and follow the, like the, a lot of characters in their minds. And so their inner world is very rich. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, mostly seen in uh, people who have creativity. Mm -hmm. Then there's another facet called openness to aesthetics. That is the second one, which has everything to do with art, beauty, and the senses. Being moved by images that come through your senses to the point that um, there's a marker for aesthetics that's called aesthetic chills. Mm. Just if you see a piece of, like look at a piece of art or hear a piece of music that really moves you, and that you get like pyloerection and all the little hairs and you get the chills. And so that has a lot of empirical support and has been tested in experimental settings. Then there's another facet that is called openness to feelings. A lot of feelings, both in depth and in variety, a big intensity of emotions. And that doesn't necessarily mean being able to regulate those emotions. It just means that you feel a lot. The fourth facet is called openness to actions. And that is the one that in our collective imagination, we think about the most when we think about openness to experience. Because it's that person that wants novelty, that dislikes routine, that will go to a restaurant and try something new on the menu, 
that will want to take a trip to a different place every year as opposed to going to that beach that we know and we love. Why go somewhere else? <laughs> do you stick with the tried and true or do you rather go and see something else even though it might not be as good? And that preference for, like, that is basically a preference for novelty in your actions. So not being afraid of changing and actually loving change, like being your best when you're like constantly changing and evolving. Then the fifth facet, that is the one that is openness to ideas. That is intellect to the point that is so strong. There's a movement to call it openness intellect mm. because it's so different than the others. And that is all about intellectual curiosity. I cannot be still until I understand everything that is going on. I will not rest until I know the theory behind it. I will not stop. I will try to understand the mechanism. I am curious. I want to learn that drive to learn, that motivation, that love of learning. That is all encompassed there in openness to ideas. And then the last, that is the one that doesn't have a direct correspondence to an to an overexcitability is called openness to values. And that is the willingness to revise values, political values, social values, religious values, cultural values, community values. And it's not a lack of values, but revising them to reflect what the community and the person needs. So it is usually related to uh, rebelliousness and not like some questioning of authority and just like, who are you to tell me these things? So all in all, all of those things together, they make up openness. And a person can be very high in one facet and very low in the other. So their general openness score might look average, but if you look at it more closely, you will see like some areas in which they are way higher than the rest. More in a minute. With neurodivergent kids, identification is important, but then what? The education experience is vastly different from one school district to the next. And although there are some very good programs out there, many parents have limited options locally. So maybe it's time to look beyond. Our friends at Bridges Academy have been educating 2E and other neurodivergent learners for over 25 years, but now they've adapted that model to a really amazing online space. Bridges Academy Online features synchronous instruction, small class sizes, and because 2E kids really thrive when they can focus on their areas of interest, Bridges highlights talent development as a bridge to college and career. And Bridges is a diploma-granting institution. If you haven't thought about the online option, you'll definitely want to talk to Bridges Academy. Just go to bridges.edu. So this might be a little bit of a chicken and an egg type of discussion, but I'm curious what your thoughts are. Go ahead. Do you think that giftedness influences personality or do you think that personality influences cognitive ability? Ooh, that is a loaded question. <laughs> I actually think they both influence each other. They both influence each other in the sense that you're born with a cognitive potential and a temperament. And then that potential will later turn into your full cognitive abilities and that temperament will turn into your personality. And that's where they play together. For example, let's say you have a very high potential and you are very open to experience. You're very curious. So you will go on learning and you won't stop and you will feel that drive and that passion and you will uh, fall in love with an idea and with a subject. And so that will actually lead to talent development in that domain that you're falling in love with. So you will increase your potential and you will reach that the top of your abilities, if we think in a, a Vygotsky sense of the zone of proximal development, as opposed to if you're more close to experiences, so to say, and you just, you're more traditional and you wait for things to be given to you and you don't feel that need to understand everything. And 
So you will be content not pursuing every opportunity that comes your way. Can you look at other types of, say, neurodiversity and identify personality characteristics that are associated with those? I don't even know if there's really been any research along those lines. I haven't looked at it before. Actually, there's fascinating research being done with adult ADHD and openness. Because that, when you talk about that novelty specifically, like that was the thing that was ringing the bell when you're talking about the need for novelty. Like that's such an ADHD kind of characteristic. The studies have conflicting results because hmm. some studies showed that they had lower openness and some studies showed that they had higher openness. And so it wasn't until they, like there was a study I just read that was kind of recent that they were digging a bit deeper and what they did was find actually three cognitive profiles associated with ADHD, a bit beyond the hyperactivity, impulsivity, inattentive and combined. It was more one more related to impulsivity and orbitomedial activity. One more related to delaying activities, more related to procrastination type things, and the other more related to hyperactivity. Mm -hmm. And so they, it was separated in those profiles. And so it was seen that the ones that tended to delay the most, that was the profile that had lower openness in general, whereas the others had way higher mm -hmm. than the general population. And so... That was an, a new way of looking at it in the sense that, okay, how do I make this work for me as opposed to against me? That's what I love about like looking at everything through the lens of neurodiversity, because we can see typical deficits and turn it into strengths and see, okay, up to what point is it making you not function the way you want to and the way it's aligned with your goals and your values in life, with the life that you want to lead. And from what point is this something that we can make sure you enjoy and use it as a strength? And novelty to me is one of great example of that. It's fascinating to think about how that all interacts and, and really how much more we have to learn about all these things as well, like how it all kind of mm -hmm. can be reframed from that deficit model. Think about it. If we're talking about novelty seeking and we are giving someone with ADHD a task that involves a lot of novelty, like they are not stuck in a job that requires so much routine and rechecking things over and over again, but they have a more creative type job, something that relies on novelty. Like, I don't know, be a location scout for movies where your job is to travel and talk to people and figure out where can we make this happen? And then you tell someone and then they make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to being stuck, in, I don't know, sitting in a bank where you have to check every cent that goes in and out, that is not a good use of your abilities. Right. I want to talk a little bit about counseling and therapy because the most widely known type of therapy, I think, is, is cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm -hmm. It's like the go-to like label. And so people say, oh, you got to go get CBT. But I think personally and, and professionally that this is not necessarily the most neurodiversity affirming framework that's out there. And you've kind of have some ideas about what might be a little bit better and, and how we can use different types of therapies more effective in, in different frameworks. What do you feel like are some of the modalities that are most effective when providing some of that neurodiversity affirming care from a clinical standpoint? I like a lot all the, the third wave behavioral therapies because they integrate more than just behaviors more than just cognitions and they like integrate a sense of like mind body awareness being in the moment and of being out of your mind all of the time yeah in that regard i've actually found in personal experience so that is not by any means scientific that is just anecdotal but in a lot of aggregate anecdotal experiences from a lot of uh, therapists that work with a neurodiverse population, 
CBT is not the optimal framework. Number one, because not all cognitions are rational. Right. And because sometimes it's not just about the way we frame things. And especially not with people who are cognitively gifted. Because if you're a master with words and you can think of a good reason to do anything, you can bring up your your best lawyer type arguments to defend pretty irrational beliefs. (laughs) That's true. They do that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the parts where you sometimes have to fill in workbooks and they can feel a little bit demeaning and a little Mm. bit like, really, are you asking me this? Like, this is all you think of my intellect and my capabilities of working on myself. And so I particularly like a lot working with ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy, with DBT, uh, dialectical behavior therapy. And right now, even the fourth wave of behavioral therapies, which is process-based therapy, not just relating on diagnoses or on conditions or on situations, but thinking about the underlying emotional processes and just being able to apply a framework to all of that. And so... I think that is a lot more affirming and it helps you find strengths as opposed to having a set of predetermined uh, therapeutic goals that you have to meet. With ACT, for example, acceptance and commitment therapy, how would you describe that? um, Like what's different about it from other types of behavioral therapies? It doesn't focus so much on the symptoms that are bringing the person to therapy. It immediately centers everything around the values that the person has. Okay, what is the life that you want to live? How does that look? And how can we make it happen despite your depression, despite your anxiety, despite your ADHD, despite your chronic pain, despite your OCD, despite all of these conditions that we may or may not be able to quote unquote fix. Mm -hmm. And so puts you on a path to living a life that you actually value without having to wait until you don't have it any more depression, until your anxiety remits or you are down 10 points in whatever anxiety scale they're using. And so you don't need to postpone it anymore. You just start now. You start where you are. You start at the point where you are and they work a lot with psychological flexibility. Mm. So It's the concept of being flexible and being accepting of what happens to us in life and moving in the direction of our values, moving like closer to what we think is important. Yeah. What I think is interesting about that is that it gives you a reason that it's more motivating than uh, being free from depression. So, okay, being free from depression. Okay, what for? Mm -hmm. Oh, because I want to do X, Y, and Z. Oh, so you're just postponing doing X, Y, and Z until you feel better? Yeah, that's procrastination. Right. There's got to be a better way than that. Yeah. The typical, when I lose 10 pounds, I'm going to whatever. No, life happens today. Yeah. Life has already started. Life doesn't wait for you to do whatever changes you want to make. And so... How can you move in the direction of your goals? Of course, if I am in medical school, I will still need my degree to practice. But it's not, oh, I want to go and cut brains today. (laughs) But I can move in that direction of the things that I value. And reconnecting with the activities I'm doing from a point of view of a purpose. I'm doing this for a purpose. It's not because I love reading a million notes that I'm doing this. It's because I hope to be a neurosurgeon one day. Mm -hmm. And so it focuses a lot on the connection with purpose and on being flexible with the difference of what is today and what we hope it will be one day. It separates you from your thoughts. Like those therapies don't put a lot of importance on your thoughts. And usually a lot of intellectually gifted people are, they have capital T thoughts. <laughs> that, is, that is also true. <laughs> Give a lot of importance to their thoughts. And that is a very easy way to get enmeshed in those thoughts. When they start becoming a little bit more complicated, and then you get stuck in that eternal feedback loop 
that can be problematic. And so wave behavioral therapies help you to take a step back from those thoughts. And you are not your thoughts. Your thoughts are something that happened to you. And so it's easier to move away from the thoughts, to take some distance and to choose a different course of action than what the thoughts are saying. And we don't even need to change the thoughts. What we change is our relationship to them. The analogy that I like to you, because a lot of people say like, oh, so it's okay that I have those thoughts that I'm worthless. You're telling me that it's okay. I'm like, uh, no, but you're saying that I have to accept them. You have to accept that the thoughts are coming. Right. They're happening. Yeah. Not that the content of the thoughts is automatically true. Because when we have thoughts, capital T, trademark, <laughs> thoughts, we tend to believe that just because a thought came into our mind, it must automatically be true. And um, newsflash, we sometimes have thoughts that are not necessarily true. Sometimes they're bogus, a load of <laughs> nonsense. And so that is what these types of therapy help us do. It's like we're in a train station and the trains are passing. When we have a thought and we jump on that train of thought, metaphorically, mm -hmm. it's like a train is coming and we automatically step into the train just because. And so CBT would be like, okay, let's make the trains go somewhere else. We will close this station. There are no more thoughts, like no more trains like that coming in. And with ACT, what we learn to do is we're at a train station. Oh, look, a train is coming. I don't like it. <laughs> I let it go. I look at it and it goes. Yeah, look, I had an intrusive thought that I'm worthless. Oh, yeah, it's a thought. And you let it go. It's not like... <gasps> I am worthy. I am worthy. It's not you fighting with your thoughts. It's, oh, look, that thought came again. Oh, silly thought. And you just let it pass. You just don't jump on that train of thought. Mm -hmm. And so it's changing our relationship with the thoughts. And that leads to so many changes that I think it's fascinating to witness. I think it's a good reframe of all of those all of those things that maybe we feel like we've quote unquote learned. And not that it's not useful in some contexts, mm -hmm. but it's just not the end all and be all. And that's why I'm happy that there's a lot of research being done on many types of therapies so that now a lot of approaches are evidence based. And so insurances are happy to pay for it. Yes. <laughs> well, Alex, I'm so happy that we've had this chance to talk today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me here. It, I had a blast. Sometimes I like to get into the weeds and think about a lot of the questions we have about neurodiversity, giftedness, and psychology. But I also recognize that there are times when we can get so far into the conversation that we can lose sight of the bigger picture. Even when some of the ways that we understand and conceptualize neurodiversity differ from each other, the bigger picture still remains. We recognize that there are individual differences within our neurodiverse world, and we want everyone to be supported, accommodated, and successful. I'm actually preparing to leave this afternoon to head to the annual conference for the National Association for Gifted Children. And I'm looking forward to connecting with Alex and some of your other favorite guests that we've had on the show, as well as connecting with some new folks that you'll probably hear eventually. Getting together with like-minded people is such a fulfilling experience, but we can't lose sight of that longer term goal of creating a neurodiversity affirming world. And that means taking the ideas that we debate when we're in the weeds and helping to do the work by advocating for our neurodivergent friends, colleagues, children, and selves. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. I'll see you next time on the Neurodiversity Podcast.
This episode brought to you by Bridges Academy Online, a high school program for 2E students. Find them at bridges.edu. Our thanks to Alex Fweek. We have links to her work on the episode 147 page at neurodiversitypodcast.com. Our host is Emily Kircher Morris. Our production assistant and office manager is Krista Brown. The executive producer and studio engineer is me, Dave Morris. For all of us, thanks to all of you for listening, and we'll see you next time. This is a service of the Neurodiversity Alliance.